fire called Jeremiah. Growing time many years. Burning time one careless moment. Drown your campfire. How many times have we read signs like these? But do we ever stop to think what they really mean? This week we'll show you. We're going to watch a demon at work, and that demon, fire. In its way, fire is a kind of magic. Like atomic power, it can be good magic or bad magic, depending on what we do with it. When it gets loose in our forests, it is the worst kind of bad magic. It destroys not only what is beautiful, but also what is useful and often irreplaceable. In our story, Bambi, we had a scene like this. Bambi was a fantasy, but this scene was not. In real life, in fact, it happens all too often. In presenting this exciting drama of suspense and danger, we want to pay tribute to all firefighters everywhere. To the forest rangers, the fire lookouts, and smoke jumpers, and all others who respond to the emergency and go out to fight the demon when it comes. This particular demon was called Jeremiah, and here is his story. Across the wide reaches of the North American continent, along the ridges of remote mountain ranges, there exist to this day vast expanses of the original virgin forest. This far-reaching sea of living, green-growing trees is important and valuable, for it is the continental watershed holding the annual snowpack, catching and containing the yearly runoff thus preventing the eroding and wearing away of the rich soils beneath. Here is timber for homes. Here is sanctuary for nature's creatures. Here is grazing for domestic animals and recreation for the nation's citizens. And not least important, here is scenic beauty. This native forest is a priceless part of the American heritage. To protect it and keep it for the future is the task of the United States Forest Service. The ranger's vigil is a constant one, often carried out from the skies. From this vantage point, which he shares with the eagle and the hawk, he has a complete and panoramic view of his seemingly endless domain. He scans the deep canyons below, the inaccessible pockets, the windswept summits, his eye constantly sweeping from horizon to horizon, always on guard, always on the lookout for the forest's arch enemy, fire. An air patrol is a passing view, a momentary glance. Around the clock scanning, the lookout tower still is best. These are the permanent eyes of the Forest Service. Perched on the tallest crags like eagles' nests, they go by many names. Old Boney, Bald Ridge, Grizzly Station. It was in one of these towers, atop Sentinel Mountain, that this story began. That summer, the lookout was a young college student planning a career in the forest service. For three whole months, he might not see another person. Still, he wasn't without company. Indeed, companionship was something he was never without. And every morning, the first chore of the day was breakfast for Frisky the Squirrel.
life had its own routine at Sentinel Tower. Get up with the sun, feed the squirrel, put the coffee on. And on really ambitious mornings, knock out a batch of biscuits. Every lookout learned these simple chores as part of the daily job. One long. That was Sentinel Tower's ring. The call turned out to be something more than mere routine. It was the district ranger with some exciting news. The lookout had applied for parachute training at the smoke jumper school in Missoula, Montana. This call was to tell him he had been accepted and to report immediately. His replacement, in fact, was already on the way up the hill. Surprisingly short time, the footsteps of the new lookout were to be heard coming up the stairs. He had arrived much sooner than expected. In fact, everything about him, uh, everything about her was unexpected. She was not only carrying a man-sized pack up a man-sized hill, but apparently was ready to handle a man-sized job. Her credentials were good. College trained, alert, self-reliant, and pretty in the bargain. In fact, the Forest Service had long ago learned that women possess a certain combination of patience and poise that fits them well for this job. Just to be polite, the guests sampled the biscuits and said they were good. But the cook had to admit that fire damage was total. Before leaving, there were a few instructions that might help the new occupant. First of all, she would inherit Frisky. She would want to know about his likes and dislikes, and how he bit people if he wasn't fed on schedule. Then a reminder about the Sentinel Tower signal. And a telephone check-in to report the new lookout on duty. Finally, a word about the summer lightning storms. During these intense electrical displays, the tower itself stood a better than average chance of being hit. And though the structure was well grounded, it was always wise to observe certain safety measures. Perhaps the most important rule was the one that said, avoid all contact with metal. Sit on stool with insulated legs when necessary to use phone. Finally, it was time to go. He wished her luck at Sentinel. She wished him luck at Missoula. And off the young man went toward his new career. Smoke jumpers are the parachute troops of the Forest Service, trained to drop from the sky in the war against fire. Candidates for this demanding assignment had to be young men, 18 to 28, and more important, physically fit. It would soon be apparent why. This was a job for athletes. jumping, strong muscles in the back and legs were especially important. To make sure these were properly developed, a device called the torture rack had been invented, no doubt by an ex-drill sergeant.
Basically, a parachute jump is a fall. Land as hard as this dummy, however, and your jumping days are over. There's more to the art than first meets the eye, and so the instructor demonstrated how to relax, hit, and roll with the impact. It all looked so easy, but these rookies would learn there was a trick or two involved. The secret was to do a graceful somersault onto the hips and shoulders so that no single part of the body absorbed the entire shock. again this fundamental routine. It was important to get it down perfect and better to fall on your face now than later. Of all the lessons to be learned at this unique school, those concerning the parachute itself were the most important. For everything depended upon this piece of equipment and its proper functioning. Meticulous care had to be taken in packing it. Each fold just so each part exactly in place. An experienced instructor impressed upon the class the importance of these procedures. The shrouds together in a neat and even skein and fastened carefully in place. If these lines got tangled, the chute wouldn't open. The recruits paid close attention to these demonstrations, as well they might. Before long, there would come a final examination, and their very lives would hang in the balance. In case the main chute did fail, there was a spare for emergency. It was smaller than the other. If it had to be used, the landing would be harder. But it was a comfort to know it was there, just in case. Often, a smoke jumper could expect to land in trees. So each man carried a stout line with which to let himself down. Like the carefully packed chute, it was supposed to be kept in a neat coil ready for instant use. But sometimes these rookies got it snarled up in a king-sized granny knot. This wasted precious moments in the race against time and often spoiled the instructor's day and his disposition as well. One final step remained, to experience the jolt of a chute snapping open. For this, each trainee wore full jumping regalia, including the helmet and mask, designed to protect the face in a timber landing. Practice on the shock tower marked the end of ground training. Next time they jumped, it would be from the sky. From the beginning, everything had pointed toward this moment. Today, they'd make the first actual jump. None of them had to go. A recruit could back out at any time. Yet it was unlikely that any would. Each man had been carefully screened for the special qualities the job demanded. The instructor was proud of this class and hopeful that they'd all do well.
Once aloft, the men sat in quiet contemplation. Feelings were mixed, but in each man's mind was the same question. When the final moment arrived, would he find within himself the courage to plunge earthward? From here on, there was no margin for error, so each man checked and rechecked his gear. As the spotter, it was up to the instructor to guide the pilot into position and manage the jumping run. Approaching the target, the plane leveled off at a thousand feet above the ground. On the first pass, streamers were released to test wind drift. Last, the waiting was over, and the first to go were called into position. Static lines that would open the chute automatically were fastened and checked. Three men would jump on each pass. The hand on the foot meant wait. Then the signal, go. Jolt on landing was comparable to a jump from a 20-foot height. And the men were glad now they had learned how to roll.
was a good feeling to touch the ground again, and a good feeling to know you were a smoke jumper. All in all, it was a good class. Every man except one hit the target. And he missed it by only a few feet. The fire season came early that year, and there was no break between training and actual firefighting. A neglected campfire, a playful breeze. The fatal flower had blossomed in the forest. Fortunately, a lookout had spotted the smoke and given the alert. It lay in an inaccessible area far from any road. Here was work for the smoke jumpers. A two-man team could knock it out if they hit it hard and fast. things first. The L markers told the pilot each man had landed safely. Then down came the firefighting gear from treetop level. In a situation such as this, the immediate objective wasn't so much to put the fire out, but rather to contain it. The first job was to dig a trench around it. This was called a fire line. The problem was to get the circle completed before the fire could spread. So the men hacked away at a steady pace, digging down to bare earth, or what the firefighter likes to call mineral soil. In this particular case, there was one small complication. The fire was burning inside a snag. Once the snag was felled, the fire was soon brought under control. From July through September, the fire has it mounted, and for the guardians of the forest, it was a time of tension. The weather got hotter, the forest got drier. The trees exuded pitch and resin until each one was a potential torch. Every possible precaution was taken to control human carelessness. But along the continental divide, the great kindler of fire is not man. It is lightning. Would it be a bad year for lightning or a relatively safe one? Whatever happened, it couldn't be much worse than the summer of 1940 when lightning started 1,400 fires in a 10-day period. Thank you. 
With her firefinder, the girl got an exact fix on the smoke clue. Now her long summer vigil had true meaning. The whole purpose of the lookout was early detection and quick action. A ranger in the district office took the call. The girl's report was brief, concise, accurate. Fire on Sentinel Mountain. Area inaccessible. A job for the smoke jumpers. And so the word went into Missoula. Precise information. Which forest, which district, which mountain. Fire call. Fire call. Report on the double. Jones. Battingill. Morris. Simpson. Smith, Carlisle, Edwards, Johnson, Corrigan, Murphy, Wilson, Morgan, Kowalski, Weldon, and Blake report on the double. timber hang-ups were to be expected, and it was in situations like this that the safety line paid off. So far, all were down in good order. Then, real trouble. A treetop collapsed a chute, and a jumper descended the last 50 feet in a free fall. kind of terrain for a landing. The kind that makes a twisted ankle an occupational hazard in this man's game. From a quick check, it was obvious that this firefighter was out of commission. So the radio phone was located and a call for help sent out. 
a rescue helicopter wasn't long in coming. stayed on the spot, made the leg reasonably comfortable, and prepared the man for the ride back to base. No room in the cockpit to lie down, however, so he'd have to make the trip securely strapped into a special litter designed for this sort of rescue work. was two hours old, but its chances of spreading seemed small. A good fire line had been slashed out and it was holding. Everything was working according to plan. But fire seldom obeys a plan. With conditions so critical, any fire held the potential of disaster. All this one needed was a little push. It got that bush from a sudden gust of wind. the smoke jumpers had to fall back and start again and hope that somewhere the fire could be stopped. afternoon, this one was what the Forest Service terms a project fire. A big one requiring an all-out effort. Like every major fire, it was given a code name. From here on, this monster would be known as Jeremiah. By nightfall of that first day, Jeremiah was an angry demon, consuming all in its path. While men must rest, a fire never sleeps, but works its havoc both night and day. A forest fire burning in the darkness can be a fearful spectacle of almost awesome beauty.
Lashed into new fury, Jeremiah raced along at an incredible pace. Down in the foothills, mountain cabins, homes, and farm buildings fell in its path. Powder Company. Explosives, danger. Dynamite may burn harmlessly or it may blow sky high. This was the time to fall back. By morning of the second day, Jeremiah still raged out of control, setting its own pace, dictating the terms of battle. Now it burned on a 10 mile front and 30,000 blackened acres lay in its wake. By the end of the fourth day, the main fire camp resembled a command headquarters, for by now the battle had all the aspects of a military campaign. 1,200 men were on the lines. Every possible source of manpower had been tapped. Forest Service, State Division of Forestry, County Fire Department all pitched in to fight the common enemy. Supplying this army was a problem in logistics. The weapons were axes, shovels, and picks. Tools of battle that had to be kept sharp and ready. Food was brought in by the truckload. Coffee by the tubful, meat by the tubful, and of course beans by the tubful. The chow here was substantial, for firefighting is a job that builds fantastic appetites. Even so, after 40 hours on the line, some of the men dropped in their tracks, just too dog-tired to eat. Crews from other states were flown to the scene, among them Indian veterans who seemed to have a special knack for the job. The Zunis were brought from New Mexico, the Navajos and Apaches from Arizona, and the Blackfeet from Montana. Any way you looked at it, Jeremiah was a rough assignment. But these Indian firefighters had the stamina and the know-how to stand up to the toughest kind of going. along the front, bulldozers tackled the toughest challenge of all, fire lines through the very heart of the forest. When it comes to battling fire on its own ground, the bulldozer is a most effective piece of heavy duty equipment. It can go anywhere and do anything, or seemingly anything. Indeed, it's amazing what chances these operators will take and get away with. By the eighth day, Jeremiah had devoured 72,000 acres. The perimeter totaled 83 miles. The fire still burned out of control. post on the line, the fire boss had discouraging news for headquarters. The wind was changing again. Without warning, it had shifted 180 degrees, outflanking the fire lines, 
and pushing Jeremiah in a wide circle behind Sentinel Mountain. The lookout at Sentinel Tower stood by her post, reporting the situation as she saw it. What she saw now wasn't encouraging. The fire front was less than a mile away and coming fast in her direction. It was time to call for help, but the fire had burned out the phone lines. Fortunately, there was the radio phone for emergencies. On the big map back at headquarters, it was becoming apparent that Sentinel Tower was all but surrounded. Somebody had to go in and get the girl out. Since it was his old territory, the young smoke jumper was the obvious choice for the job. Within seconds, he and the helicopter pilot were in the air. Now, every tick of the clock counted. This was one rescue that might not come off. The pilot found it heavy going in the thick smoke, and except for his guide's knowledge of the area, he would have been hopelessly lost. Meanwhile, the girl had abandoned her personal belongings. But at the last moment, she remembered something she couldn't leave behind. so close and the smoke so thick, the rescuers were forced to land some distance away and hope the girl could find them. Sentinel Tower itself was lost. Finally, after 11 days, the wind died down, and control of Jeremiah seemed possible. Now, with the air calm, Planes could be used to mop up the hot spots. In pointing their targets, these aerial tankers dropped chemicals to cool down the fire's fury and flame-proof the fuel in its path.
after many discouraging defeats, the weary crews fought the blaze to a standstill. The fire called Jeremiah lay down to die. Total damage, 130,000 acres consumed. Fire perimeter, 117 miles. In time, nature would replenish and restore the scorched land, but not immediately. For generations to come, the ugly scar would remain where fire had ravaged the earth and wrought its terrible devastation. In the cycle of natural things, the flames had come to fulfill the ancient biblical promise of the prophet Jeremiah. I will kindle a fire in the forest, and it shall devour all things round about.